tell you, I wasn't sure if that was going to happen. I spent almost all of yesterday in the Orlando airport, and they kept saying, delay, delay, delay. <laughs> and I finally text my cousin, who's a minister on the west side of Indianapolis, and said, I've got this feeling that God has read the sermon and said, no thanks. <laughs> So, so it is very good to be here with you today. Uh, we have one, of course, we have the announcements that you see on the screen. And please pay attention to those. Uh, but we have one other announcement. The library, the church library that has really gone through extensive work. And people have just done a fantastic job. Down in Fellowship Hall, there are still books that can be taken free of charge. And they are even categorized down in the Fellowship Hall for you to decide what areas you want to look at. But right after church day, now please don't leave now. <laughs> But right after church today, you can uh, go down and get one of those, or several of those books that you find interesting. We're going to conclude by praying the breakthrough prayer together. Almighty God, may your preferred world break through. Usher in and accomplish through us your new hopes, dreams, and possibilities, both in the life of our church and in our own lives. We surrender our wills for yours in order to fully follow you. Empower us to always answer, Yes, Lord, send me. Amen. Water is needed for life itself. No one can live without drinking water. The earth also needs water to stay healthy and grow. Water has many refreshing, healing, and powerful properties that a person needs to not only live, but to thrive. There are several sources of water. Lakes, cisterns that collect rainwater, springs that are cool and refreshing, and rivers that flow at different speeds along their journey to the sea. Jesus chose not to respond to the matters raised by the woman, including the apparent impossibility of his obtaining water for her. Instead, he brought her back to the central issue as far as he was concerned. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. is joy, whose word is truth, whose spirit is goodness, whose holiness is beauty, whose will is peace, 
whose service is perfect freedom, and in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life. And to you be all honor and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This says something different, and I know you can both read, but when I was a kid, very, very long time ago, we used to call these lifesavers. Now they have a different name, but it's the same thing. I want you to have those there because I want us to think just a second about lifesavers. You know, we're here at church. 
and we're listening to the wonderful songs, and we're hearing the prayers, and we're, we're listening to the message about God's love for us. And I want us to think about the fact that God is our lifesaver. Now, maybe not in a very drastic sense that if I use the word lifesaver, somebody thinks about, but just in our whole life, just who we are and what we can be and how we can treat others, God gives us life and is our life saver. So when you eat those this week, or you can devour them all today if you want, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want you to remember who our real life saver is. And our real life saver is God. Can we have a prayer, please? Dear God, thank you for being there for us. In the good times and in the bad. Always knowing that you're there to save us. Please stand as you're comfortable for the scripture reading. Our lesson today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, starting with verse 13. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
Kevin, thank you for your talents and the music you provide for us. Bell Choir, thank you. That was wonderful. We really appreciate the beautiful music that you gave to us today. And Mary, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Um, as I began to prepare the message uh, a few weeks ago, actually, as I was writing through it, it seemed to become really personal. And I thought, is that right? And then I thought, you know, that's exactly the way the message should be. It should be extremely personal because that's what our relationship with God should be. It should be extremely personal, whether it's Christ gently touching us and saying, I'm here, accept me, or for maybe some of us, Christ grabbing us by the collar and saying, hey, I'm here. You know, follow me. Listen to what I am telling you. And so, as I went in preparing this, I thought, you know, it's all right for it to be extremely personal. You know, we, we saw in the scripture lesson just a second ago, John 4, 13, 14, and I'll repeat it. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. It's no secret that I love reading the upper room as a devotional, whether it's in the morning or the evening. And this past month in March, there was an article written by a gentleman who uh, lives actually in New Jersey, so I automatically like him. Um, but the article, and I want to share it with you, was really touching. My wife and I drove to the boardwalk in Ocean City, New Jersey knowing that my sister would soon succumb to cancer at the age of 44. The constant sound of the waves had always been a comfort to me, and Ocean City was one of my sister's favorite places. As we sat on the beach, the sunset turned the sky into magnificent shades of pink and blue, and, and we've all seen those beautiful sunsets. For some reason, I felt that all would be well. Turning toward the rocky shore, I saw a man dressed in traditional Scottish attire. He began to play Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. I could not believe what I was seeing and hearing. My favorite hymn played with such feeling and emotion, I came to believe that this man had been sent by God as a message of peace and comfort to me. As he finished and headed down the beach, I watched him intently, wondering if he would disappear into thin air. In Hebrews 13:2 we are told, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. I believe we all have an opportunity to bring God's comfort and peace to others. You know, I do believe in the existence of angels. I, I do believe of them as a celestial body. Now, the theology going along, if, if we ever can become angels, it is up for debate with a lot of theologians. But 
we can be angels on earth in our human earthly form when we stop and try to meet the needs of others. It may be something as simple as praying for someone that we know needs our prayers. It may be as simple as giving someone a meal, giving someone a place to stay. But we can indeed be angels here on earth. When Thomas saw the risen Jesus on that Sunday after Easter Sunday, he began to leave the Doubting Thomas label, and he trusted. He surrendered to Jesus. He believed in Jesus. And then he received Jesus. It is the same with each of us. We can trust in Jesus. We can surrender our lives to Jesus. We can believe, and we can receive a joy beyond anything that we can comprehend. We're in a time period right now after Easter, before Pentecost, we're in that seven weeks time frame. Pentecost fell on the important harvest festival in the Jewish calendar. Pentecost is the Christian festival celebrating the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus after his ascension, held on the seventh Sunday after Easter. Pentecost comes from the Greek word meaning 50, designating those 50 days. Now think about what we as a church are experiencing now and what the disciples experienced so very long ago. The disciples had experienced Christ's death, which was extremely sad to them, extremely scary because they were followers of Christ. Were they to be next? But they had experienced Christ's death. Then they had experienced Christ coming back to life. And then his ascension into heaven, all in that 50-day time span. In Philippians 4, we are told, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Think about that. When we think we can't do something, when we think we can't stand strong, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ said, I am the good shepherd. I give eternal life, and you will never perish. Just two Sundays ago, we celebrated Easter, and we heard in John 20, while it was still dark, God was already at work. There are times when we face loss personal loss, loss of control in, our, in many aspects of our lives, yet God is already at work in each and every one of your lives. President Hoover once wrote, the Bible is a postgraduate course in the richest library of the human experience. The existence of the Bible we are told by the great theologian Immanuel Kant, the existence of the Bible is the greatest blessing which humanity has ever experienced. And Henry Emil, who lived in the 1800s in Switzerland, wrote this, Sacrifice still exists everywhere, and everywhere the elect of each generation suffer for the salvation of the rest. Sacrifice, which is the passion of great souls, has never been the law of society. Yet every life 
is a profession of faith. While it was still dark, God was at work. Augustine wrote, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. To love God is the greatest romance. To seek God is the greatest adventure. And to find God is the greatest achievement. Paul wrote in Romans 8, For I consider that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is yet to be revealed to us. Without stepping on anybody's toes, we are, for the most part, an older congregation. <laughs> now, I include myself in that, so... But we are, for the most part, an older congregation. So, with age, they always say comes experience, and that's true. But also, it means that we have experienced loss and have suffered many losses in our lives. I, you know, I personally, 876 days ago, lost the better half of myself. So, we understand Lost. Yet, this time period right now in the Christian church is a time period for rejoice because though all of us have suffered loss, we also have Christ's resurrection to bring us eternal hope, eternal life. While it was still dark, God was at work in our life. You, know, you hear that there are two types of individuals. Those people that see a glass half empty and those people who see a glass half full. When we enter into and invite Christ in our lives, we automatically receive a glass that is half full because of his resurrection and his promise of eternal life for us. We can dwell on loss or we can count our blessings and say, here am I, Lord. Take me and use me for thy kingdom. All history all history, and I love history. All history is but the length and shadow of great men and great women. And the greatest shadow cast is that of Christ. It has been said that when human beings stop believing in God, that they believe in nothing. But the truth of the matter is this. When you stop believing in God, the truth is much worse because we tend to believe in anything. <clears throat> and we see that in our world today. Helen Keller would say, I do not want the peace that passes understanding. I want the understanding which brings peace. While it was still got dark, God was working in our lives. What does it mean to follow Christ to be a Christian? Back when I was in high school, 100 years ago, uh, I came across a poem that I really, really loved, and it's been a part of me all my life. And it, it goes like this. Heretic rebel feigned to flout, drew a circle and shut me out. Ah, but love and I had wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. You know, I, I see 
in the United Methodist Church today, churches that are voting to leave the church on a matter of philosophy. And I'm so proud of Bradley that we have stayed in the United Methodist Church because I think that poem is really speaking to all of us today. That poem says, heretic, rebel, thing to plot, drew a circle and shut me out. That's not what Christ wants for us. Christ didn't do that with anyone. Christ drew a huge circle of love as we are supposed to and brought everyone in. Yeah. No matter what our shortcomings and faults may be, we are supposed to draw this huge circle that brings everyone into our life and into the life of the church. Not to say that the other churches are wrong, but maybe misguided along the way. I love what Napoleon Bonaparte wrote. I knew men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I founded empires. But upon what did, the, did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Yet, Jesus Christ alone founded his empire on love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. I think Napoleon had it right. While it was still dark, God's light of love shone throughout. Lincoln said, nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Boy, I think we see that in our world today, in our society today. We need to not thirst for power but to thirst for God's love, for God's guidance in our lives. While it was still dark, we look for God's light. Psalms 23 said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now think about that. Think about what the psalmist is saying. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He doesn't say, surely evil and destruction will follow me, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, surely hate will be with me, and I will be in the house of the Lord forever. No, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those that show goodness and mercy are not showing weakness, but eternal strength. Robert Boyle said it best when he said, Christ's passion, his death, his resurrection and ascension confirm for mankind his being God as well as man. This is the message of resurrection of the days following Easter. All right, you've been counting, I know. I've already quoted Lincoln, so you're waiting for a Hallmark quote. <laughs> well, here it is. In one of the Hallmark Christmas movies that are all so great, the best gift 
come without bows. Well, I want to amend that quote. I want us to remember today that the best gift came with an empty tomb. Think about that. The best gift came with an empty tomb. We are granted eternal life because of Christ's sacrifice. We must climb every mountain to see God's dream for us. For while it was still dark, God brought his light into our lives. May we pray. Dear Lord, challenge us this day to draw that circle of love to include everyone. Challenge us today to remember that when we see darkness, it is only temporary because Christ came to us to bring the light, the light eternal. Amen. Please join us in uh, standing and singing our next hymn.
please state it. Dear Lord, visit upon us this day. Give us your strength, give us your comfort, give us your love, give us your insight and understanding <coughs> to how we can better serve you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, the ushers would come forward as we present to the Lord our tithes and offerings.
to all the world. Go to a thirsty world and share the overflowing grace and love of God's eternal nourishing water. Amen.